Uh, so hello, so welcome back to our final session this morning. Um, thanks for bearing with us. I realize there's, um, this is a, a very quick paced talk that we're going through today. And um, uh, just to let you know that we're um, hoping to, to get the feed of all these talks on our um, website, on the uh, Sheffield Gastro website later on, um, uh, probably early next week for you to be able to go back and uh, and sort of redigest a lot of the things if you've had um, trouble keeping in touch or had to nip out or keep uh, or miss any of the talks um i'm here today at, for the last session with my co-chair uh, uh, mr nihal shah who's um, one of our hepatic surgeons um, and pancreatic surgeons who's uh, we work with in our mdt and uh, help me co-chair the session so our next speaker this afternoon so this morning is uh, ewan dixon who's a uh, consultant um, pancreatic surgeon in glasgow and Ewan is, um, uh, uh, it's been really kind to speak to us today um, about uh, really what we, we find is a very controversial topic of uh, borderline resectable uh, pancreatic cancer. And um, he's had great experience of this um, after being um, a successful, um, a, a successfully awarded the James IV um, Association of Surgeons Traveling Fellowship, where he was able to go around both Europe and the US uh, to gain experience in other practices with this. Um, so we're really keen to hear his opinions and uh, experience of this uh, this morning. So Ewan, thanks ever so much for joining us and um, uh, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks both to Andy and all at the BSG for the very kind invitation, but in particular to Andy for his extreme and superhuman patience with my very much lastminute.com approach to the logistics of uh, getting this talk together. So thank you. There are um, three main aims to this talk. The first is to briefly outline our approach to the patient with borderline resectable pancreatic cancer in Glasgow. Secondly, to describe what I learned during the fellowship that uh, we just mentioned there. And thirdly, to discuss the fairly significant challenges and perhaps some potential solutions in how you manage the patient with borderline operable pancreatic cancer. So our current practice since 2012 is to broadly split patients with peri and pulmonary malignancy into two main groups. The patients with potentially resectable pancreatic cancer or PDAC patients, they come forward for a combined EUS, ERCP and tissue and stent. They then go to neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus or minus chemo rad and then resection assuming all is appropriate. The second group of patients are those with the non-PDAC peri and pulmonary malignancy. So broadly that's the cholangial carcinoma, duodenal cancers and pulmonary cancers. They'll either go direct to primary resection whilst jaundice, for example, or they go to a stent and resection depending upon comorbidity, uh, frailty, deconditioning and patient physiology. First question is why would you approach uh, the PDAC patient with a neoadjuvant therapy in the first instance? We think that you really get the best outcome if patients complete multimodal therapy for pancreatic cancer. Our own experience in the west of Scotland is that the best chance of this happening is if they have oncology first and then surgery. We now, for the first time in the last few years, have more effective chemotherapy in the form of fulfirinox. And if you look at our initial experience over the last um, eight or nine years, we've had some excellent radiological and pathological responses. It's probably too early for us to make an absolutely definitive call regarding the improved clinical results such as survival. But if nothing else, and I feel quite strongly about this as a pancreatic surgeon, it probably avoids the Whipple resection in a patient who had otherwise occult metastatic disease at the time of surgery and is who, who's going to declare themselves as such three or six months post major resection. So moving on to the complete pathological response, um, here is a patient who had um, fulfirinox, then chemoradiotherapy. This is the um, post neoadj CT. Now, I'm not sure if I can get the video to play in this, uh, but essentially um, this lady had a double duct sign, a very bulky um, uncinate process lesion, had a neoadjuvant approach and was discharged in day five post Whipple resection. And she had a complete pathological response in that this was a T naught, N naught, R naught, PDAC. Now she's still alive six years later with slowly growing lung mets, but has a, a good quality of life. We all have anecdotes. We can't base everything on anecdotes. This is just to say you can get some excellent results with, um, with new adjuvant therapy. We've had some fa fantastic, um, in fact, you can just see here coming down now, there's her tumor with the vein uh, close to it, the stent running through it, and she's done very well following her surgery. 
We've also had patients who have had significant vascular responses. 62-year-old chap, if you follow the portal vein coming out the liver, unfortunately I don't have a pointer to show you, but follow the portal vein down, you lose it behind the neck of pancreas just there where the duct's dilated. So there's an almost completely occluded splenoportal confluence with likely SNA involvement. We regarded that back then as irresectable. The patient had an FNA adenocarcinoma. We thought this is a patient who's never going to come to surgery. And so he went on to have um, fulfirinox in a palliative context. But again, watch the portal vein coming down. And as it goes behind the neck of pancreas, the vein has completely opened up. There's cuffing around the SMA. We have previously regarded this in the non-neoag setting as irresectable disease. But in the context of neoadjuvant therapy, you don't know what that soft tissue cuffing is. And he went on to have a Whipple resection with negative margins. So a good path response and a good vascular response. As surgeons, we all know that there are what I would call the five degrees of Whipple. There's the virgin Whipple. That's a patient who's had an, who has an ampullary cancer or a cholangiocarcinoma relatively straightforward in pancreatic surgical terms. There's the post-acute pancreatitis Whipple after ERCP, a bit more challenging. There's the Whipple for chronic pancreatitis where someone has super glued the planes together before you get there. The next level up is the Whipple post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which I find even more challenging. And the fifth degree of Whipple from my perspective is a patient who has had neoadjuvant chemo and radiotherapy and someone has poured quick setting cement around the planes before you get there. So five degrees of whipping. Because of that increased surgical challenge, you have to have a different interoperative strategy. Here's a whipple I did a few years ago, where I think pattern recognition is critical. You need to have experience with the virgin whipple to know where the structures are. This is you looking from the patient's right hand side, you can see the duodenum, and where my forceps are pointing, there's dense fibrotic tissue around the superior mesenteric vein, and you get this awful fibrotic tissue in the vein groove, which makes dissection much more challenging. As a result of that, um, I do all these Whipple dissections now as an artery first approach. That means doing the superior mesenteric artery or SMA dissection before you go anywhere near the vein. Here's a Whipple again, I think from a few years ago, looking from the patient's right hand side, you can see the inferior vena cava, the left renal vein, the aorta, and there's a sloop around the SMA. The arrow shows the direction of travel of the SMA, and I think you really have to clear all that tough tissue before you go on to do the vein resection to check you can actually get this out safely. If I can't do it artery first, I now regard that as a deal breaker, and I would convert the patient probably to a bypass. And so in that sense, it's almost entirely analogous to doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, where if you can't achieve the critical view of safety, you convert to an open operation, and that has to be a very binary uh, manoeuvre in your mind. Aberrant anatomy in these patients often poses additional challenges. Again, looking from the patient's right hand side, the Whipple resection is being performed here. You can see the transection margin of the pancreas. You can see the portal vein and the SMV where there's been a side swipe out of the vein to achieve a negative margin. The SMA has the blue sloop around it and then the replaced right hepatic artery, rather than coming from the common and off the celiac, is coming directly off the superior mesenteric. And that, I think, increases the technical challenges, particularly in patients where they've had a neoadjuvant therapy. And so you have to have an interoperative strategy. This is a Whipple um, from a few years ago in our unit where I've exposed all the vessels. You can see the cut edge of pancreas lying just to our right of the photo, the edge to the right of the portal vein. You can see the portal vein, the inferior vena cava, the aorta, the SMA has been skeletalized. And you can see that the danger zone in these patients is quite often at the level of the tributaries, where vein resection and control of the venous structures can be much more difficult. Again, there's a side swipe out the side of one of these tributaries, which I always uh, unashamedly blame on the registrar who was helping me, but I suspect that was me. The point here is these are vascular operations, and they're often much more difficult after neoadjuvant therapy. The nightmare scenario for me is what I would call whack-a-mole bleeding, and that is where you have multiple vascular structures in a small area surrounded by dense fibrous tissue. You get bleeding from one part in, a, in an effort to control that, you get bleeding from something else, and you can end up quite easily with multifocal venous exsanguination, and that's the whack-a-mole bleeding. The best way to uh, get around that is to avoid it rather than have to fix it. So careful dissection and experience with the non-borderline resectable pancreatic cancer patient before you start doing neoadjuvant resections.
Leading on now to the Travelling Fellowship, this was an extraordinary experience that I was very fortunate to have a couple of years ago, um, awarded by the James IV Association of Travelling Surgeons. And it allowed me to travel around the world and spend time in the company of other surgeons and the, the, the wider team, including gastroenterologists, radiology, critical care, anaesthetics and so on. There really is no substitute um, for time in the company of another surgeon. It's how we used to learn our craft specialty and it's very much an apprenticeship. So this was an experience where I got a huge amount of um, uh, learning opportunities from this and you just can't get that from Google, Google or PubMed or conferences and so on. The theme and focus of these travels was how to manage the patient in the neoadjuvant setting, particularly with regard to borderline operable pancreatic cancer. And so there were four key areas that I looked at. Patient selection and the neoadjuvant approach, staging of disease, surgical techniques, and rescue strategies. I managed to visit the Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, onto Penn in Pennsylvania, uh, the Mass Gen in Boston, some time at the UMC in Amsterdam, the Verona unit, a quick stop off in Poland to give a talk, and then on to Heidelberg. My first morning at the Mayo Clinic was uh, extremely embarrassing where I walked through the marbled lobby of the Mayo Clinic and it looked much more like a very high class five star hotel. And as I was walking in, I got a lovely tweet from Professor Steve Wigmore, who's one of the directors of the association saying, it's fantastic, you'll be a great ambassador for the association and you'll, you'll really represent us very well. And little did he know that my suitcase was still in Heathrow and I turned up um, unshaven, dressed in my fight flight clothes and probably um, had far too much alcohol en route to the venue, so slightly embarrassing when I first started. Neoadjuvant therapy was a standard approach in all but one unit. Heidelberg tend not to do neoadjuvant, and when I gave a talk on neoadjuvant, it almost resulted in a fist fight, as you can see here. But they were wonderful hosts, and they explained why they do things slightly differently from the rest of us. This is the take-home message about neoadjuvant therapy for the borderline resectable patient from my travels. Fulfirinox is used up front for all PDACs. The variation only really occurs on how long they give it for, but almost every unit was given Fulfirinox and they found the same surgical challenges that we did. Radiotherapy was also standard in most units. This is Ted Hong from the um, Mass Gen in Boston. And he described the different approaches to giving radiotherapy in conjunction with chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting. And a lot of it comes down to timing. If you've given conventional radiotherapy, leave the patient three or four weeks. If it's been the short course radiotherapy, two to three weeks is sufficient. But they saw the same kind of vascular complications we see with difficulty in tissue handling and post-optive thrombosis, particularly of the, uh, the veins. Case selection, they were doing patients with metastatic disease, and this approach is very much evolving. Lung mechs were no longer thought to be a contraindication to surgery, particularly if they were small or indeterminate, where we often tie ourselves in knots in the decision making. Even liver mechs were under study at the Johns Hopkins unit, uh, particularly with um, patients who had less than four liver mechs prior to resection. And perhaps more controversially, but certainly pushing the boat out at Mayo, they were using a high pec pathway for the patient who had peritoneal disease. This is a world away from what we do in Glasgow, but we're very much now moving towards probably resecting patients who have small volume lung mets or at least indeterminate lesions. The staging after neoadjuvant therapy is one of the biggest challenges to managing the patient with borderline pancreatic cancer. And that's because the CT can no longer, in my view, differentiate viable tumour from, from fibrosis. So if you have a patient that looks resectable after neoadj, it's often worth exploring them. There were also many units using enhanced metabolic staging, so MRI PET or CA99 and following the trend. And one of the key lessons I learned was you plan your resection based on the initial CT. So even if, as I showed you, you have a fantastic vascular response, you often have to remember that you're likely to have to do a vein resection if the vein was involved in the initial CT scan. Vascular resection and reconstruction was one of the most fascinating parts of uh, my travels. There was a huge variation in practice. Vein resections were standard in most centres. They were challenging and tended to be done by the pancreatic surgeons rather than the vascular surgeons. The surgeons were much more anxious reconstructing veins than arteries, and that would mirror uh, my experience. Arterial resections were done in selected centres, and in some units they were resecting everything. 
my observation was that the technical aspects of arterial resection were slightly easier than vein resections because arteries handle better technically than veins, but the post-op morbidity was much greater. And in fact, the mortality was around 8 to 10% in some centres. If you look at what they were doing in Heidelberg, they were doing the triangle procedure where they were taking out all the tissue around these vessels and the triangle was bounded by the common hepatic artery, as you see in the top of the left, the right hand picture, the SMA and the portal vein. So all that tissue was skeletalized and cleared and they got fantastic results doing that, but it was technically challenging. Mayo took it to a completely different level altogether. This was the first case I saw, a 54-year-old chap who'd had 15 cycles of fulfirinox and radiotherapy, had a total pancreatectomy. They took out the SMA and reconstructed it with the superior, um, sorry, the superficial femoral artery from the groin, and then took out the SMV and put that back together with a Gore-Tex graft. And in fact, when you look at the kind of things they were doing by the end of the operation, there wasn't an awful lot left. This is looking in at a Whipple resection where you can see the portal veins being reconstructed the superior mesenteric arteries being reconstructed with a artery from the groin and all the tissues being cleared around the cava and the aorta. The abdomen looked empty at the end of these operations. Last slide, uh, the volume was striking in these units during this fellowship and I think this is the future for borderline operable pancreatic cancer. If you look at what we do in Scotland, about 100 cases per year, and then look at that across the six or seven units I visited, they were doing two to seven times what we are doing in the whole of Scotland. And that's why they were getting great results. So my take home message is that this was a humbling and extraordinary once in a career opportunity. Total neoadjuvant therapy, I think is a future for all PDAC, not just borderline. Chemotherapy is given in many units for longer than we were doing it. Radiotherapy is given in many units and the timing of surgery thereafter was critical. Radical approaches such as I've shown you, I think are appropriate for the patient who's had neoadjuvant therapy for borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. Risk management, including doing total pancreatectomies after arterial resections to avoid leaks, compromising your joints was crucial. And rescue strategies were used very aggressively across the units. Finally, and we know this to be true for all aspects of medical care, high volume units plus experienced teams lead to very good outcomes. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, Ewan. That was an excellent talk um, and uh, lovely to see that uh, picture in Mayo, which is pushing the boundaries with arterial reconstructions. Um, my, my one question mainly is that, you know, those patients who don't respond but have not worsened after neoadjuvant treatment, and when you take them for a trial, trial dissection and trying to take it out, because we don't know whether that's a desmoplastic reaction or there's RV cancers there, do you do a biopsy? Uh, before uh, when you're not sure, I mean frozen at the time, or you just kind of take it out? And is there any role of IRE at s in those settings? It's a really good question. And whenever you give a talk like this, um, it always sounds like you've got all the answers. And the reality is that none of us have all the answers. So it's, it's a great question. It's one that exercises us frequently. But the bottom line is pre-neoadjuvant therapy. So going back in our unit 10 years ago, if it looked irresectable in CT, it was usually irresectable. The point you made now is that after having neoadjuvant therapy, you can't tell what's desmoplastic reaction and what's viable tumour. And I think I've tried to distill it down now to a very reductionist approach. And that is, if on the post neo CT, there is no absolute contraindication to resection, such as an irreconstructible vessel or significant liver or lung nets, then it's reasonable to explore the patients. But I would always go in artery first, and I would do exactly as you've suggested, which is do frozen sections around the superior mesenteric artery as your first manoeuvre. And sometimes you have to do um, extensive mobilisation to get there. But if the frozen sections around the artery are positive, I would stop at that point and convert to bypass. If they're negative, I would keep going because even intra-op, you cannot tell a difference between viable tumour and desmoplastic reaction a lot of the time. So it's a really good question. We don't have all the answers, but that's my reductionist approach to it. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Ewan. It was uh, great uh, listening to your talk, and we'll let you go now. Um, and we'll have uh, Dr. Matt Huggett. Uh